Imagine you're the ruler of medieval Serbia. You love your people, even though sometimes they don't love you back. And you want to make their short and mostly miserable lives just a tiny bit better. You want to build roads, universities, and maybe even a functioning sewage system. But the poor sods in the countryside, well, they just won't pay any extra taxes. So, what do you do? Well, you turn to the Jews, or the Venetians, or maybe even the faraway Dutch, and you ask them for money. They're always eager to oblige, in return for modest interest rates in the uh, low 20s. Naturally, you take the money and hire some local stonemasons, and they build whatever it is you wanted to build, and then the Ottoman Turks show up, conquering your kingdom, deposing your dynasty, and subjugating your people for the next 300 years. All the best with that, by the way. Now, as far as the moneylenders are concerned, the benevolent construction projects they had paid for were, well, still around, even if slightly modified. The problem for them was that they had lent their money to Serbia, and Serbia no longer existed. Then again, they could ask the Ottomans to pay back this loan, but extracting payments from someone with this many swords and cannons was never a simple affair. Now, this somewhat hypothetical example of ours illustrates the core conflict in the history of debt succession. Lenders would demand repayment for debts that conquerors had nothing to do with. I had nothing to do with it, but I'd like to keep the wall, please. It's important to note that prior to the 17th century or so, debts weren't really held by countries, but rather by people. Thus, our imaginary Venetian friends weren't really lending money to Serbia, but rather to its ruler, so they'd have little cause in pursuing that debt against the Ottoman Empire, for example. Sometimes you'd find provisions for debt inheritance within the family or dynasty. But when it came to foreign conquest, well, all bets were off. But as philosophy and law progressed, some started arguing that maybe the conquerors were indeed responsible for the debts of their newly obtained territories. This line of thinking emerged from Germany. Ah, the Germans. There's the right way, and then there's the German way, you know. Or, as it was then known, the Holy Roman Empire. This nominally gargantuan state was in fact made up of hundreds of smaller countries, each vying for power with its neighbors. When about half of those countries decided that the Pope was no longer cool, the other half decided to murder them. Hmm, that's one solution, I guess. 30 years and 5 million casualties later, and you've got France, Sweden, and her Protestant allies carving up territory from the HRE, short for Holy Roman Empire get with the lingo. But this time around, certain bright philosophers made a compelling argument. Since the debts of the lost territories were backed by physical assets, the debts should follow those assets to their new owner. France reluctantly agreed, and so when it annexed the region of Alsace, it also took over its debts. Let me have those debts, thank you very much. Oh dear, what have I done? Sweden, on the other hand, argued that the territory it had gained was merely a fief, so it didn't pay anything. History is rife with cases such as these, where shaky legal arguments and implicit military threat ultimately decide whether the debts get paid. A great example comes from the good old USA, when Texas declared its independence from Mexico and petitioned to become a state. One of the big questions was what would happen to its debts. I say, in exchange for all those debts, why don't you have a couple of my cows? Now that's a deal right there. Over the next decade, as pro- and anti-annexation factions struggled for power in Congress, market speculators bought Texan bonds for cents on the dollar, hoping to cash in on a U.S. annexation. The U.S. eventually went to war with Mexico over Texas, and when it won, it agreed to pay off those bonds, minting many a millionaire in the process. A similar situation unfolded a few decades later, when the US purchased Alaska, and again when it annexed the Kingdom of Hawaii. In both cases, the US footed the bill. Back in Europe, when the Kingdom of Sardinia was conquering its neighbors and creating modern-day Italy in the mid-1800s, it agreed to take on the debts of all the countries it was unifying. When it was finished, the collective debts became Italian bonds. 
Bond. Italian Bond. Shaken but not stirred. Again leading to a healthy dose of speculation. They just didn't have options back then. So gambling on bonds was the best they could do. In general, from the 19th century onwards, whenever a conquering country could afford the expense, it would either directly take on the debt or it would at least pay it off partially. That's how you get seemingly contradictory situations like when Japan annexed Korea. Even though the Japanese were intent on assimilating the Korean people and erasing their culture, they still paid off all their debts. It does make sense in a way. Creditors are usually foreign and rich, so it's a good idea to keep them on your side when you decide to conquer someone. The only country that was consistently inconsistent in its debt successions was the British Empire, which would alternate between paying everything off and hunting down the creditors depending on the Queen's mood. Off with their heads! Except him! And them! I like them! This, of course, is extremely understandable considering the hegemonic power of the British Empire. After all, when you've got a track record of invading nine out of every ten countries on the earth, you're free to do with the foreign creditors as you please, I tell you. I mean, what could possibly be wrong with that? Well, my friends, I hope you enjoyed this impromptu lesson on the history of debt succession. If this knowledge ever proves useful in your mercantile adventures, do keep me in mind when you're rich and famous, and maybe even consider supporting me on Patreon. In any case, be on the lookout two weeks from now for the next avariciously enlightening episode of SideQuest.